Hello, this is Rachel Bevan from Oncology News Australia, proud producers of the Oncology Journal Club. This week we have a special episode focused on global disparity in cancer care. It's a jam-packed episode with an in-depth interview with Diana Safati, Chief Executive of the New Zealand Cancer Control Agency. Eva Segalov chats with Mark Lewis, who's a medical oncologist, patient and advocate, who recently wrote an article titled Disunited State of Cancer Care in America. We also hear from Derek Ragavan, who updates us on his mobile lung cancer screening van. Eva talks to us about kissing in her quick bites, and we've a few thoughts from Steve Vogel in New York too. Links to all of the papers discussed today are available in the notes. We hope you enjoy today's entertaining and informative episode. For the latest oncology news and podcast updates, subscribe to the Oncology Newsletter for free on oncologynews.com.au. This is Rachel Babin, and this is the Oncology Podcast. G'day, g'day, g'day. Today, we have a very important topic. We're not talking about whether Albury is better than Wodonga or even Melbourne. We're talking global disparity and cancer. We have a series of interesting papers and some fascinating interviews. Craig's going to talk to Diana Safati from New Zealand. I wonder if she knows Merv. I hope he's asked her that. I'm talking to Derek Ragavan, ex-Aussie, now in the US, about his cancer bus. We've got a fascinating interview with Mark Lewis and his recent editorial in JCO Oncology Practice entitled The Disunited States of Cancer Care in America and our wonderful friend, none other than Vogel New York, talking about his experience of cancer disparity in New York. So enjoy the episode. Lots of food for thought when we're sitting in our fancy oncology clinics with prescribing very expensive drugs. Are these available to everyone? That's, in fact, the field of global oncology. And how do we move towards equity? My favourite person to follow on Twitter is Mark Lewis, MD. And if you don't follow him, immediately go and look him up on Twitter. He is hilarious. He's an oncologist but also a patient, an advocate, a great wit and a very compassionate and concerned doctor-patient as well. We've got a fascinating OJC meets Mark Lewis and you can hear the extended interview and follow the links to that. And we've got snippets of him discussing disparities in the Midwest So some of what Mark had to tell us about disparity is coming up right now. Tell us about disparity around where you are. Yeah, it's funny. I just actually wrote a piece last week in the Journal of Oncology Practice about this gulf in America. And I imagine you might see the same between a metropolitan and rural care. I think a lot of it has to do with where I won't say centers of clinical excellence, but centers of research tend to be. So there's a certain critical mass that's required, I think, of both you know, physician scientists and laboratory personnel, and then just the clinical research support staff. You need people and you need resources to do a lot of early phase research. And so I think a lot of the very cutting edge trials tend to happen in larger areas. And again, that's encouraged, at least so far, this magnet model where patients have to travel to centers and whether that's the States or Australia, that can sometimes be off over significant distance. So what's happened as an unfortunate consequence of that is the delivery of the standard of care has also not been universally applied across the US. And so again, that's one of the reasons I'm so passionate about my job is I'm very lucky to serve a population that's traditionally been underserved and also to bring them when appropriate research. Now it's really tricky, of course, to do a phase one study using this kind of paradigm. 
But you can actually do quite a lot around cancer care delivery, as we just discussed, and really think more about how is the science being implemented, not necessarily the really early conceptual stuff and the dose finding trials, but how are you actually implementing it in the real world? And I think that's really the promise, again, of closing the gap between metropolitan and rural cancer care. And then finally, again, the hub and spoke model that we've adopted during the pandemic is working pretty well. And this idea that I can sit in my office with a computer and reach out to not just other hospitals and clinics, but patients themselves, I think it's going to stick around. I really do. I think the patients like it enough. I think we've been able to deliver care without too much decrement in quality, but I think that's going to be a lasting legacy of all this. Is there an oncologist type that doesn't like that? <laughs> that's a great question. I have to be very careful how I answer this. No, I, I would say that, again, I think there's been a shift. And I'm not saying that the oncologists that have preceded us have been universally paternalistic or made it all about them. But again, I think the model of delivery, especially when it comes to research, has been you're going to come to me and you're going to engage at my center and you're going to go back home whenever the protocol is done. That's kind of been the way it's gone. And so I think it's definitely challenging the way people have done Again, certainly early studies for years. And then the other thing I point out back to the social media is there's a little bit of a leveling of the playing field there in terms of access to information. I'm probably dating myself, but I vividly remember in medical school having to go to the library and look something up, you know, in print, like, you know, go into the archives and get some old dusty periodical and look it up. And so the information age and the way things are now readily available at the fingertips has really allowed the patients, I think to do a lot more of their own research. And that's challenging, I think, when you're used to being the one that sort of tells them things and now they're coming in with you know, sheafs of research that they've done asking questions. I think that doesn't rub everybody the same way. I think it's a challenge to our expertise sometimes because you can't replicate years in oncology with a Google search. In fact, there's a, a rather <laughs> condescending mug that you can buy here that says, don't confuse my medical degree with your search engine. And I think underlying that is this tension between access information and wisdom that you can only gain through experience. And so I think there's a little bit still there, a uh, friction between the patients that are questing for knowledge and then people that have sort of traditionally been oracles that are sought out for their specific expertise. And now we cross to have a look at Derek's raggy van. For those of you who remember Derek Ragavan, he was practicing in Sydney before he saw the lights and lure of the United States, where he's had an illustrious career. But he now is the president of the Levine Cancer Centre with a major focus on reducing disparity. And here we look at his recent paper describing the use of a raggy van to go out to the population and perform CT lung cancer screening. Over to you, Derek. So we were just talking in our global episode to someone, because I'm now a mentor, so someone I'm now a mentor to, Maria, in Mexico City, and she was telling us during the height of COVID there about a month ago, they were not allowed or they ran out of resources and they were not allowed to divert funds and they had to let patients with testis cancer die. So it's not all about having the scientific knowledge. It's also about health systems and resources. So I'm looking forward to asking you about that because I think you are in a land where there is both an abundance and a paucity depending who you are as a patient and maybe who you are as a doctor as well. Yep. You know, I think and I'm not lecturing you either because you're the editor of the Journal of Global Oncology and so you, you have a personal window into this. But, you know, the great fallacy is that there are places that don't have disparities of care. I had a very interesting discussion with a luminary of French oncology who said, oh, no, no, we don't have disparities. We have nationalized medicine and everybody is fine. 
But that's just not true. You know, the disparities there will reflect the fact that within nationalized medicine, there are some limitations and there are particularly immigrant groups that have difficulty of access to care. And they'll have all the barriers like linguistic and their own financial barriers. There is this illusion that a nationalized system will cover everything, but it doesn't cover babysitting and transport and all time lost from work and all the things that make it so much harder. So I think people love to say that, you know, countries with nationalized care are protected, but I think that's really not true. That doesn't detract from the fact that in the United States, which has such largesse and such excess in its medical care, there is a huge and vast chasm between the haves and the have-nots. Although I will comment that I think at the Levine, we seem to have figured out how to fix that. There was a very interesting paper, in my opinion, that was presented at the plenary session of ASH, the American Society of Hematology this past year by some of my people, led by Bay Hu, who is one of our junior faculty. And I was commenting on a paper that I'd written with Siran Karukian when I was the boss at the Cleveland Clinic. And Siran is a brilliant epidemiologist. She actually works at Case Western Reserve University, and we are friends in a developed collaboration. And we published a study, I think it was in cancer, where we looked at eight curable malignancies by any definition and compared outcomes for people with private health insurance versus those with Medicaid, which is our national kind of pickup for people without any resources. We have Medicare for the elderly, and then Medicaid is for people who oftentimes have psychiatric disease and therefore can't work, but it'll also be people with renal failure who are on dialysis and things like that. Anyway, we compared outcomes, and predictably, the people with private care did much better, had much better cure rates. And obviously, lymphoma was one of those. So I said to him, you know, we've got a very extensive nurse navigation system that I've created. I'll be interested in a few years' time to see how much impact that has on outcomes. And so Nil and Chan and Bay reviewed their seven or eight-year experience with diffuse large B-cell lymphoma and discovered that our outcomes for the indigent black community and the general indigent community were superimposable on the wealthy white community. No difference, although this was statistically underpowered, no difference between the wealthy black and white community. Well-powered was the rich versus poor. And those outcomes were superimposable on the outcomes at Hopkins or the Cleveland Clinic or you know top places. So that was presented, and I think what it says is that with adequate support and really focusing on the issue of underservice and under-resource, you can make outcomes be the same. We've also looked at our myeloma data, and that's standing up just as well. And as I'm sure you know, the African-American population has an increased incidence of myeloma. And so the fact that our outcomes are similar, and that includes marrow transplantation, we've created mechanisms to ensure that we can transplant safely in groups who are under-resourced because of the nature of the support we give them. It's a really incredible story, and it probably leads us very nicely to the paper that we're going to discuss, where you've gone from being a taxi driver to, I think, a bus driver. Is that correct? Well, I have to be honest. Uh, I'd love to claim personal credit. The bus is not driven by me. I think they think I'm too bad a driver. I drive too quickly. And the bad habits I learned pushing cabs, I think they feel that I'd probably knock the CT scanner off its uh, setting. So I will say one thing that I have always thought was kind of funny. There's a very wonderful guy here called Otis Brawley. And for many years, he was the chief medical officer of the American Cancer Society. He and I have been friends. We actually co-chaired the ASCO Disparities Committee many years ago. And Otis, before he moved to Johns Hopkins, came to visit and drive our bus and he left leaving a little booby trap for me. So he told everybody that it should now, instead of being called the lung cancer bus, it should be called the Ragavan. And so that was, uh, that was, I love uh, that. That was interesting. I love that. So this paper that you've published in the oncologist is called the initial results from mobile low dose computerized tomographic lung cancer screening unit 
improved outcomes for underserved populations. Trips off the tongue, doesn't it? It's it does. just a nice handy, the, uh, handy title. The Ragavan sounds much better. So can you tell us about where the idea came from, what you did in the study, and what are the next steps? So we have been very active in screening outpatient populations. So we have a very active mammography program, colorectal screening. I think you know, Ava, that I'm very doubtful about the benefits of prostate screening, but in the black community, I think there's still work to be done. So we include them. And the area that we weren't doing much was uh, lung cancer. I do a lot of my thinking oddly in the shower. And so one morning I was thinking about this, heading to work. I had a meeting with my disparities team and I just came to work, happy to say that I got dressed first, and said to the team, you know, I think we should get into the field of uh, low-dose CT scanning. And what we know from all the other enterprises is you need to take the screening to the population. So I said, just get one of the mobile units. I saw a nice program on 60 Minutes or something like that, which showed mobile scanning for stroke. And they came back much like my teenage daughters and you in your younger days with a roll of the eyes and said, they don't make them. And so long story short, there were no large whole body CAT scanners. So we contacted Samsung and GE and said, this is what we'd like to do. How about it? And GE wasn't interested and Samsung were. So the trick was to get the thing mounted on a sufficiently robust vehicle. So we went to the oil industry and got them to a company called Fraser to make us a heavy-duty mobile vehicle that had good suspension and so on. So we created the unit, and then off we went. So to cut a long story short, it was all a learning curve. The thing that has interfered with progress in the work for the disparities group is what I think I would call analysis paralysis. Instead of saying, look, let's just build something and try it, people try to make something perfect conceptually. And so nothing ever gets done. And so we just had the van and we said, let's find out if it works, if it's if the images are of good quality. We had to transfer them electronically after a bus trip to you know some peripheral site. Was the scanner still working? Anyway, so the long story reduced was it worked. We've scanned, well, now we've scanned more than 1,200 people. But at that point, we'd scanned about 550, and we thought it was worthy of recording what we'd done just to let people know it was interesting. We found all up at the time of reporting, there are a few extras that have popped up at second screen. We found 12 lung cancers. Six of the patients were treated with curative intent, five surgically and one with radiotherapy. You'll understand our pack year history for these people was a median of 45. We're in the South. It's the smoking belt. So these guys have mucked up lungs. And interestingly, and this was not completely anticipated, we found two other primary tumors, a nasopharyngeal cancer and a pancreas cancer. They were both treated with curative intent. The nasopharyngeal was actually interesting. We had a a lesion that we were suspicious about in the chest and did a PET scan. The chest lesion was nothing, but it showed activity in the nasopharynx, and we chased that, and it was a nasopharyngeal cancer. And then we also found, I think it was 16 18% who had significant cardiovascular calcification. And so we chuffed all of them off to the Heart and Vascular Institute, and we actually are now just in the process of developing a collaboration with them where downstream, by intent, we'll use this vehicle to, to look for heart disease as well. We're about to do a randomized trial, which will compare hospital-based screening to uh, mobile screening to demonstrate proof of principle. And the other interesting thing I should mention is we specifically excluded people over the age of 65. Now, if we were back in the old days, I'd ask you why we did that, but I'm not going to put you on the spot. So the reason we excluded them is in the United States, Medicare covers those people for lung screening, and so they could get screened anyway. So if you think about it, Our population excluded those with the highest incidence of lung cancer, and that being the case, we think that uh, if you included the elderly, the numbers of fines would be even higher. And our population of underserved, and again, that's the theme of this discussion, we had 20% black Americans that we got. So that was in line with our demographic. In the national lung screening trial here, the incidence of black Americans who participated in hospital-based screening was about 4%. 
How did the population take the arrival of the bus and the process? I think they took it well. You know, we, as I mentioned a minute ago, emphasize navigation. And so our nurses are really attuned to helping this population. They've done a whole lot of collateral work in terms of helping with food shortage, helping people get connected to general practitioners, helping them get access to other care. So back to the issue of disparities, on a broader social level, I wonder if you'd like to comment about how American society lives with these disparities and where you think that's going in the future. Yeah. You know, I think it's not all that dissimilar to society in Australia. You know, the society is bimodal. There will be resourced and wealthy people who spend their lives trying to fix stuff. And then there'll be resourced and wealthy people who ignore it completely. So Craig went looking for Merv to interview, but he came up with a close second. Professor Diana Safati, the newly appointed CEO of the newly formed New Zealand Cancer Agency and the incoming president, I believe, of the UICC. We've got Diana on the show to talk about disparity in the Pacific Island nations, which, of course, neighbour many of our listeners in Australia and New Zealand. So Diana is trained as a public health physician, cancer epidemiologist, and is a well-known health services researcher. And she led a wonderful series of papers published in Lancet Oncology in August last year, which touched on the issue of disparity with a focus on the Pacific Rim. So Diana, it's a great privilege to welcome you onto the show. Thanks very much for coming on. Thanks for having me. So on reading these this series of papers, I was really struck by the scale of the problem of cancer control in the Pacific, but also there's some messages in there of solutions and hope offered in the papers, which was great. So do you want to just start by outlining the series and especially the first paper in that series of five? Yeah, well, just to maybe backtrack a little bit, the reason why this series of papers was produced by Lancet Oncology was because I found that when I went to a lot of cancer control conferences around the world, when they talked about the issues facing low and middle income countries, there was very little, if any, reference to the Pacific region at all. It focused very much on Africa, on India, sometimes the Middle East, where there are, of course, major issues, but very, very different to the issues facing Pacific countries, which are, as you know, they're widely diverse in many respects, but they are by and large, very small, they're isolated, they've got often very fragile ecosystems impacted by global warming, very small population sizes. And that sort of set of challenges is quite different to the challenges facing other countries. So basically, there was a sort of water cooler conversation between me and the editor of Lancet Oncology, who was really keen to get a series of papers relating to small island developing states, so the Pacific and Caribbean in particular. And that's where the series sort of arose from. Cancer, of course, is a major problem, but it's not the only problem. To set the scene, tell us a little bit about the global health issues there, including the concept of NCD, which was a new term to uh, me as an oncologist. Yeah, so as you say, because these countries are very small, almost regardless of how much, you know, if you're thinking about tax income, for example, if you've got a very small population of, you know, maybe 200,000 people or less, even if you're paying quite substantial taxes, you're never going to have enough money for the kind of infrastructure you need for complex illnesses like cancer. So that's one issue. So that's just the size of the countries and the size of the population. A second issue is that these countries have been really impacted affected by so-called lifestyle diseases. There's a whole variety of reasons for that. But what we see in many of these countries are very high rates of obesity, for example. So very, very high rates of diabetes, high rates of renal disease, as well as cancers, both due to infectious diseases and to what we might consider those lifestyle factors, which means you've got a really complex set of circumstances of countries with very limited resources, fragile health systems, and a lot of competing demands. 
Yeah, so as I said, the issue of the non-communicable diseases or NCDs is something that obviously is a big issue and cancer is part of that, but there's a huge problem with obesity in these countries as well. Yeah, that's right. Really extraordinarily high rates in some countries, you know, sometimes one in four adults with renal disease and even higher for diabetes. But the Pacific region has quite a lot to teach us as well in relation to preventing NCDs and non-communicable diseases. They're doing, for example, a fantastic job at monitoring the 22 countries of the Pacific in terms of their prevention activities. So they've got a process called the Pacific Monitoring Alliance of NCD Action, so the Pacific MANA, they call it. And they look at each of the countries in relation to policies that look at tobacco, unhealthy food, sugary drinks, a whole range of things. And they monitor each other. Um, and they've been really doing some very innovative things in that space. So they're really dealing with this very seriously, the NCD problem there. Great. So tell us a little bit about the scope of the cancer problem, the scale of it, and some of those common cancers, which are a little bit different to what we see in the yeah. high income countries. Yeah, so some of the cancers there are similar to the ones we get here. So lung cancer, for example, a leading cause of death across the Pacific for men. And breast cancer is very common. That's number one cause of cancer death for women. But a lot of cancers relating to chronic infection, cervical cancer is the second leading cause of cancer death. And of course, here, it's much, much lower down because we have really good immunization and screening programs, which are not well in place in the Pacific. There's also a lot of other infection-related cancers. So cancer of the liver and stomach are both in the top five in, over the Pacific region. And uterine cancer or endometrial cancer is also a really important cause of cancer in the Pacific and is, of course, increasing because of those rates of obesity. One of the things that struck me in the paper was the sort of lack of resources that we would take for granted. So there was a lack of surgical resources, almost an absence of medical oncologists and radiotherapy resources, and even a lack of palliative care and access to morphine and basic analgesics. So as you say, for all of those, so medical oncology, I mean, there are a whole range of issues there. But if you look at the entire Pacific region outside of Guam and French Polynesia, there is, well, at least at the time these papers were published in 2019, there was one medical oncologist in Fiji no radiation oncologists at all, no radiation oncology availability outside of Guam and French Polynesia. So it just gives you a sense of you know, the difficulty in getting cancer treatment in those countries. Yeah, it's extraordinary. And I saw a little vignette about there was one radiation oncologist in Papua New Guinea and he died. And then after that, the radiation machines haven't been operated for a couple of years. That's right. So, I mean, the issues, if you think about radiation oncology, obviously the size of the population is a problem. If you've got very small countries, the caseload is not big enough to support a radiation oncology centre. But even where there is a big enough population, so Papua New Guinea, for example, has a population of somewhere between 8 and 10 million people. The costs of the infrastructure are too high. Maintenance and repair keeping machines maintained is a real problem. And then workforce. So exactly as you say, there was a radiation oncologist there who died and then no one to take over. So Yeah, it's extraordinary. So and we think about, you know, maybe traveling and exporting the patients to Australia and New Zealand. I noticed that quite a few traveled obviously from New Caledonia to France and some to China and Taiwan. So we think about, you know, this idea of travel as a solution, but in practicalities of that are quite problematic. And one of the statistics I picked up on there was 16,000 patients diagnosed in a year, but only 1,900 actually travelled overseas to access treatment. So is that one of the solutions? We just ship the people to the first world countries. Well, it's a solution, but it's only ever going to be a solution for a relatively small minority of cases. It's obviously very costly for the countries to send people out. And there are processes to decide who travels because it's obviously not just cancer patients. I mean, anyone with complex medical conditions. But that process can be quite time consuming. And in the case of cancer, what can happen then is that people are actually have advanced to the point where actually travel is no longer feasible or is no longer likely to be beneficial to them. So the travel is costly to the countries, but it's also hugely costly and burdensome to the patients. So often they might, for example, have the cost of the cancer care covered, but not the travel or the accommodation. And that's well beyond the means of many people in the Pacific. So whilst people do travel, it's 
it's only a part of the solution at best. So what does this all translate into in terms of the outcome? So do we have data on what the survival rates are compared to high-income countries? for people with these cancers? We don't have good data on that, partly because the infrastructure around cancer registration and stuff isn't well developed in most parts of the Pacific. But what we do know is that people are much more likely to be diagnosed with very advanced cancers and that there is very limited access to cancer treatment for most patients. So we can, you know, we kind of know that cancer survival is going to be much, much poorer. Yeah. Well, I saw one figure was 10 to 15% of cervix cancer patients in Fiji got the radiotherapy that they required. So that must translate into bad outcomes if they could be measured. Yeah, that's right. And in Fiji, they're probably getting better care than in most parts of the Pacific because they have got relatively specialised care in Fiji. So other parts of the Pacific are going to be doing much worse. I mean, just as an example, going back to Papua New Guinea, population of 8 to 10 million people, 600 islands, 800 languages, and 80% of the population living in rural areas, no medical oncologists, no radiation oncologists. So you, you imagine that's the context in which you're w- living and working. It's very difficult to see how you're going to get adequate cancer diagnosis and treatment in that context. Yeah, absolutely. So it's all a bit bleak, but so let's turn now to the second paper, which was you were the senior author, but the first author was Alec Ekerim from University of Samoa. And after reading the first bleak paper, this was actually a little bit enlightening because it did set out a bit of a roadmap, talked about the four major problems and what four major solutions might be. Do you want to just outline those for us? Yeah. So again, a bit of background on that paper. Um, When we were doing this series, so we had two papers on the Pacific, two papers on the Caribbean, and then a kind of an overarching paper. We were really keen to make sure that there wasn't just bleakness because, you know, if you just look at the stats, they are a bit bleak, but there is a whole lot of innovative stuff going on in the region. And so we wanted to highlight some of that. So that second paper was exactly that. And the examples that we highlighted there was some work in the prevention space, as I mentioned earlier. There's work in terms of regionalization, so particularly in the US affiliated states, they did some excellent work in terms of building a coalition across a number of islands so that they were able to leverage off that for additional funding and additional services. There was a great model of pediatric cancer care, which was a partnership really between a group of pediatric oncologists based in Auckland and a number of Polynesian countries in particular to ensure that children with cancer were being diagnosed and treated adequately. And there was a range of elements of that particular program. And then there was the development of specialised surgical services. And again, a partnership between the Royal Australasian College of Surgeons out of Australia and particularly the Fijian National University to develop and train specialised services within the region who then stayed within the region because their training was there. And that's been really effective in terms of increasing the number of surgeons around the place. Yeah. And I thought that was good because there was a real sort of train the train element to that. It wasn't just about surgeons flying in from Australia, teaching people and then leaving. It was about enabling them to train more staff. Is that correct? Yeah, that's exactly right, because what was happening previous to that is people who wanted to train in surgery who were living in the Pacific tended to go either to Australia or New Zealand to train, and then, of course, they tended to stay there. And so only a few of them would actually go back to the Pacific. So as exactly as you say, there was a shift to moving the training into the Pacific and then increasingly having Pacific surgeons training Pacific registrars who then stayed in the Pacific, but with the support of surgeons in Australia and New Zealand, so that professional support and being part of that broader group, which has been a really fantastic initiative. So I think the scale of, that's a great initiative, but the scale of the problem and the work that needs to be done is quite enormous. I noticed that uh, the paper set out that with projected increase in the cancer cases, there actually needed to be about a thousand new surgeons trained to provide an adequate surgical workforce by 2030. The baseline is like a handful of surgeons now, is that correct? It's a lot more now than it used to be. I haven't got the numbers in front of me, but there's been a really substantial increase between the, sort of the 1990s, you know, the sort of 20 or 30 years from the 1990s, from really there were a handful to, I think we were up to about 90 or more 
but I would have to go back and have a look at the numbers. But a huge improvement. Of course, workforce issues are really widespread. So in the surgical area is one aspect, but of course, across cancer care. So very few pathologists or radiologists, I think one third of Pacific countries has either a radiologist or a full-time pathologist. As we've already talked about, really no medical oncologists or radiation oncologists and even sort of, sort of specialised nurses or allied health, all of those need investment and development. Yeah. And again, really difficult to do that in a context with a very small population and low levels of resources. Yeah. So tell me about the point of care testing, which was an interesting, one of the other examples that you cited. So that was an attempt also to overcome this shortage of pathologists and treating doctors. Yeah. So technology is exciting in relation to this region. Some of the things that might be possible include point of care technologies, as you say. So, for example, in the context of cervical screening, there's been some excellent work that's come out of PNG and is now growing in some other parts of the Pacific, looking at the role of point of care HPV testing, where women can self-sample, have the sample tested and get the result at the same time. If it's positive, they can then have VIA visual inspection with the you know, acetic acid to see if there's a major lesion and then they can be referred for colposcopy and treatment if necessary. But that first bit is all done at the same time. So it doesn't require cytology. It doesn't require really good IT systems to kind of follow women up and then call them back in if you have a abnormal test. So it gets rid of a whole lot of that complexity at the front end of a screening program. And there are likely to be other point of care technologies which will be helpful, but also telemedicine and those kinds of technologies may also be really helpful in the context of the Pacific. And so certainly the pediatric oncology people, specialists and nurses and others working in that area are using telemedicine type technology. And you could see that that might well be one of the solutions going forward. So perhaps developing the capacity for some basic chemotherapy on island, it's not going to be able to be as technical or as complex as what is possible in New Zealand because you're just not going to have the supportive care and the kind of rescue treatments that would be available in New Zealand or Australia. But some basic chemotherapy so that at least the highly curable cancers can be cured. Great. So let's focus in on the third paper. And to me, that was what I was reading there and what I was thinking about was, so what can I do? What can countries do to try and help our Pacific neighbours with these problems? Yeah. And so, as you say, that last paper was exactly about that. So what can we do to help? And a lot of it is helping with infrastructure elements. So helping, for example, to develop reliable and affordable supply chains. So again, if you're very small countries, it's very difficult to manage a supply chain that would be necessary, you know, chemotherapeutic agents, for example, getting those to a country. So helping with that sort of thing, helping to develop regimes that are going to work in the context of those islands. So providing clinical expertise in a way that allows the development of skills on island so that the chemotherapy can be delivered there. Helping with with other infrastructure things. So for example, helping to develop screening programs. So people with expertise in that to develop some of the infrastructure that would be necessary to set up cervical screening programs. So there's a lot of those sorts of things. Certainly going and helping out on an island can be helpful, but going in and coming out again, flying in, flying out, doesn't provide a long-term solution unless you're spending a lot of time training up local clinicians. And if you're going to be doing that, that needs to be very much in partnership and making sure that what you're delivering is what they need as opposed to what you think they might need. One of the discussions and debates going on in political circles in Australia is about our foreign aid budget and sort of soft diplomacy aspects of that. Notice that we actually may be losing that race to some of our um, international competitors, as it were, because there is a growing influence of other countries in assisting the Pacific Island nations. Yeah, that's right. So there is a shift. And you're seeing it sort of both ways, actually. There's more um, resources coming from other countries outside of what we would typically think of as the countries that mm. supported the Pacific. So the typical countries, you know, Australia, New Zealand, and then the US and the northern part of the Pacific and France for the, the French affiliated countries. But now we see China, for example, having quite a strong influence in the Pacific, Philippines to some degree. But you also see patients, when we're thinking about cancer, also using the health services in those countries. Yeah, that was a really interesting aspect. So we have a lot of disparity within the high-income countries. So do you think there's any lessons in cancer control for the high-income countries 
that we can learn from some of those innovations and initiatives. So, for example, is that point of care testing program something that could be tried in some remote regions within Australia? Or are there other lessons for us to learn? There may well be some of those technologies that allow you to overcome the tyranny of distance, which is a lot of the issues facing the Pacific relate to that, would be or could be applicable in settings in Australia and New Zealand where distance is a real problem. The issue that we face in high income countries is making sure that we don't offer a sort of a second tier system in areas that are more remote. So you have to be confident that whatever you're offering there is either equivalent or if it's not equivalent, be very clear that the benefits to people are such that it's still worth it because they're not actually accessing care elsewhere or they're not accessing what's available outside of their own region. So there's got to be some caution there within a high-income country. So that there are some parallels, but there are some very distinct things about the disparities between countries and the disparities within countries. Yeah, absolutely. So I wanted to say congratulations for the series. It was clearly a huge amount of work with a big team to pull that all together, what is going to be increasingly a big problem in the decades ahead with increasing cancer incidents. Some of the take-homes for me were around networking. The cooperation between countries is really important. So congratulations. I thought it was a really great series, well worth people delving into. Yeah, thanks. There were a lot of people involved in it. It was a big undertaking, but yeah, fantastic to do. Okay, so thank you very much for discussing those papers. I just wanted to turn now and speak a little bit about the new Cancer Control Agency. So tell me about the name. I was, I'm going to get this wrong. Te Aho o Te Kahu. Te Aho o Te Kahu is how it's pronounced. It's fairly and close. And what you does were that, bad. Tell me what it all means. So the Cancer Control Agency in New Zealand came about as a result of really strong public and sector advocacy for stronger national leadership in relation to cancer control. So, you know, cancer prevention, cancer treatment, palliative care, the whole lot. And it came into being at the end of last year, 1st of December. So we've been in operation for nine months and we've we've had a this small matter of a global pandemic that you might have heard about. So that's added we're, sort of an interesting C word on this podcast. Right? <laughs> no, that's right. No, no, we keep away from that. Good idea. But we've been working very closely with Maori partners in terms of setting up the agency. So it has a really strong equity focus. And so the whole structure of the agency is around that. For example, the council that advises me, the most senior advisory group, is half Māori, half non-Māori. And then in addition to that, sitting under that group is a group called Heohuru Mōwai, which is a Māori cancer leadership network, which provides further guidance. So we have really strong guidance. We have a number of senior staff members who are Māori and then teams who are Māori. So we have a really strong Māori first, equity first, approach to everything that we do. And as part of that, Heohuru Mōwai gifted us the name Te Aho o Te Kahu, and it means the binding weave of the cloak. So if you think about you know, a traditional cloak that a Māori leader might wear, the top yes. part of the cloak is the binding part of the cloak. So the metaphor there is the strands of the cloak are all the kind of people, the organisations, the structure that make up the cancer system, and we are rollers to bind to unify, to pull together all of those strands to make a kind of a unifying whole which, you know, embraces and protects those with cancer in their families. So that's where our name comes from. So bravo New Zealand for the immediate stark difference, I think, between New Zealand and Australia. One of the differences is this, I think, really effective engagement, integration, Maori culture into some of the national agencies. So congratulations on being the first lead of that agency. That's fantastic. Thanks. I noticed you've got a new cancer plan was launched as well. So what are the main aims of that being the first one? Yeah, so the four goals of the cancer plan, the first one relates to sort of having uh, good systems governance processes in relation to cancer. And one of the main elements of that first goal was to implement a cancer control agency. So we're kind of the result of that first step. Second one is about achieving equity, equity in relation to both cancer incidents and cancer outcomes. We have a treaty obligation to put Māori first when we think about equity, but also, of course, a range of other groups who tend to do worse in relation to cancer. 
cancer. So Pacific groups, people who have physical disabilities or other disabilities, people that have experience of mental illness, for example. So there's a range of other groups that we also are responsible for ensuring equitable outcomes for. The third element is fewer cancers. So in other words, getting better at prevention. And the fourth one is better survival, better supportive care, better end of life care. So it's more about the clinical aspects. So those are the four elements of the cancer plan, broadly speaking. Fantastic. So we had Dorothy Keefe on the show this year and she spoke a little bit about what her plans were, what her vision or legacy might be. And so it's a little bit early to be asking about your legacy when you've just started and it's the first year of the agency. But if you could write your legacy now, what, what would you like it to be? What I would like it to be is that we have definite, clear, measurable progress towards equity. But in some respects, I'm lucky because I've been tasked with setting up the agency. So if there is the agency itself. <laughs> that would be, you know, that. So I actually leaving a really functional agency that provides that national leadership in general and has that really strong quality improvement for treatment and consistency for treatment as well as equity and strengthening prevention. If we can do all of that, I'd be extremely happy. Yeah, so how exciting to be able to sort of help shape all that and really make a difference at the outset. And it's a bit, I think, the start of any organisation. Obviously, there's a process to set it up, but you can really get some runs on the board by making some easy changes, easy wins at the start. So. Yeah, no, it's both incredibly exciting and incredibly challenging. And, you know, as I said, added to by the fact that it was 10 or 12 weeks after we started that, you know, COVID really hit. But having the structure that we had in place, albeit that it was very nascent, it was very newborn. We had only very few staff and things, but we were able to pull together all the cancer centres in the country and to develop really clear guidance about how we would manage in terms of medical oncology, radiation oncology, haematology, cancer surgery, um, colonoscopy, depending on the state of the pandemic so that we were all operating in a consistent way. We've been very closely monitoring the situation at national level from a cancer diagnosis and treatment perspective. And that, that has been quite unique actually in the world, looking at other countries involved in sort of international task force on this. And we were able to move quite rapidly because of the structure we had in place, which was fantastic. Yeah, that's great. So, Diana, thank you very much. It's been great to hear perspective on the Pacific Island nations and some early thoughts on uh, the new National Cancer Agency in New Zealand. So we'll keep an eye out. And if there's a relevant paper, we'll get you in to comment on it if you're happy to do so. We have a few New Zealand listeners, including some guy called Merv, who's rung in a couple of times. But we wanted this to be not just uh, Australia relevant. We're mindful of the global listeners as well. So thanks again for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. Great to talk to you. Well, that was a great interview with Diana Safati, and now it's back to Eva. So we have a paper from Nature Scientific Reports published on the 30th of April 2019. It's an important paper about disparity Craig, I know you tremble with fear when we mention nature papers, worried about the high level of science. So listen carefully and I'll go through it slowly. So the paper is called National Income Inequality Predicts Cultural Variation in Mouth-to-Mouth Kissing. First author, Christopher D. Watkins. And the paper says that romantic mouth-to-mouth kissing is culturally widespread. Use and appreciation of kissing may vary according to whether the environment places a premium on good health and partner investment. I think that means if you've got bad breath and bad teeth, people don't want to kiss you. So they tested for 13 countries from six continents in behaviours and attitudes according to national health, GDP and relative wealth. And they showed that kissing is valued more in established relationships than it's valued in courtships. Okay, thinking back to the last pash in my very long marriage and comparing that to courtship. They also said consistent with the pair bonding hypothesis, 
relative poverty, income inequality, predicted the frequency of kissing across romantic relationships. So this gesture of mouth-to-mouth kissing may be important in the maintenance of long bonds in specific environments, but it varies according to population income. A very important paper about disparity. I'm sure you'll agree. So we can no longer go through a podcast on an important topic without asking Vogel New York. He practices up in the Bronx as a solo practitioner and he sees people from all walks of life. And we asked him his impression. We hear a lot about disparity and health systems in the US. So there are uh, lots of disparities. So why don't we talk about my mix and then you can talk about the disparities because I make an effort to give my patients the best treatments possible. That doesn't mean they always let me, but I try. The mix, since uh, the Bronx is kind of a funny place, in New York City, the wasps, white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, and the Jews move out. The Italians do not. So the Bronx was uh, really devastated in the late 1960s and early 1970s. The middle class, the working class moved out, a bit large sections of the Bronx, but the Italians stayed. So I still have some Italian patients, uh, the elderly, the younger ones all speak English, who speak no English at all. So I learned a few Italian words, mostly from the opera, to communicate with them. And I actually, my office receptionist is Italian. Her Italian is good enough, so uh, she comes in to translate. The Bronx has a lot of people who speak only Spanish. Uh Most of them are either from Puerto Rico, which is part of the United States, or the Dominican Republic, which is half an island in the Caribbean. And I just had to recruit a replacement for a medical assistant who would work for me for 25 years. Uh, She retired to take care of her grandchildren so they wouldn't have to go to daycare and get exposed to COVID. She is Dominican. I just replaced her with a Puerto Rican because one of the prime requirements was that she would be able to translate and willing to translate. Because for the Spanish patients, uh, the nightmare is you ask a simple question with a yes or no answer. And there's a five minute discussion and the answer has neither yes nor no in it. (laughs) So I I needed a translator willing to exactly translate my words and to tell the patient, no, no, answer the question. (laughs) But so, and there, there are plenty of people from other ethnic groups and it's not by and large a rich upper class population. The it's a lot of working people, and there's some uh, quite poor people. I take care of a number of illegal aliens. That's a huge challenge, huge, huge challenge. The system in the at least in New York allows them to get insurance for the poor, but keeps granting it and taking it away. So try and pay for expensive therapies or expensive supportive care when all of a sudden there's no one to pay. I have this one lovely young woman with metastatic breast cancer. It's a huge challenge to take care of her. She's functional. She works. She takes care of her children. But it's very difficult. You know, in uh, civilized countries, care for sickness is considered a right. By virtue of being alive and taking air, you get medical care. Not in the United States, although not officially in the United States. In truth, There are laws that protect these people. So if they walk into a hospital emergency room, they have to be cared for. Unfortunately, the hospital is only following the letter of the law and will spend no effort or money to take care of them beyond that letter of the law. And do you think disparity has got worse in the last 10 years, what the rich can afford with all the cost of cancer drugs in the U.S.? Are you limited by what you can offer your patients if they don't have a lot of money or insurance? So you can look at this several ways, and this is a little bit nuanced. So I'm not sure I can say this in a way your audience will understand. So if your interest is in disparity, the disparity has gotten less. Why has the disparity gotten less? Because there isn't enough money left for almost anybody. All right. 
except the top 10th or 100th percent of the population to pay the absurd prices that are being charged for the drugs and sometimes for the hospitals. They're all charging very inflated prices. So when everyone is being screwed, the disparity goes less. The total quality, the, the ability to deliver optimal care relatively quickly has gotten much worse because all what happens is the people selling the service, if they don't sell it at all, they make no money. So they're interested in making a lot of money. So they want to sell the service at a very high price. So there's almost nobody who can pay $200,000 a year for O.C. Merton in the United States. Almost no one has $200,000. And if they had it, they wouldn't have it for three years. So the drug company will discount, but they're not allowed to discount. So there are all sorts of bizarre ways, fake charities that they have to allow them to discount or they give away the drug. So you can do this. You can get this done, but it's a lot of work. It diverts you from taking care of patients to going through hoops to get the drugs. And there's a new drug for myeloma. Just got re- approved in the United States two months ago. Turns out all the drug was in Italy. So it was approved. But no one could get it. Uh, as best I can tell, I was the first doctor in New York to give the new drug on a commercial basis. We actually wound up the drug company gave it to us free. But it took six weeks in this near terminal patient. Uh, I sent him. I've, he was a very difficult man. I sent him to. I tried to send him to multiple institutions for the last two years because there were a bunch of wonderful new drugs and studies to which I had no access. He wouldn't go. So I got him to go to several institutions and they couldn't get him the drug either. So I got him the drug eventually. But it's a stupid system now. So I've never done that because I wasn't in a position. You know, it's not so easy. But I think the issue, uh, you guys aren't talking about oncology at all, but the issue is what's the big problem with the system? And the big problem with the system is that it costs too much, okay? You know, if you throw away enough money, you can solve all the problems. But the big problem is it costs way too much and doesn't have to cost that much. Let's talk about hospital care, which is not as manipulated. When you have a system where the hospital hires hundreds of people to code a little higher to say the problem is a more difficult problem, pay me more. And then the government hires hundreds of people or the insurance company hires hundreds of people to say you're coding too high, we'll pay you less. All those hundreds of people are doing our patients no good. They're just arguing over the money. And that's a huge cost. And the computer systems, I I occasionally, I don't have an electronic medical record. I use a computer to type my notes, but I no one tells me what to put in them. The electronic medical records are designed for billing. So they're designed so the hospital or whatever entity is billing for the doctor gets another 50 cents for asking a bedridden patient whether he smokes and for calculating his BMI, 50 cents, something like that. Could be 75, could be 25. And the entity, the hospital or the physician group, will penalize the doctor unless he puts the BMI, basal metabolic index, in his note. So the note is full of garbage. They get paid an extra $10 if they have a lot of labs and x-rays, they bill for that. So every note has the same lab report and the same x-ray for pages and pages. When I get these typed, it goes nine pages. And maybe there's one line with what the physician thought was important and what he's going to do about it. That's horrible. So it's been another really interesting, varied and insightful edition, at least I thought so. Disparity is an important topic. It's not going away anywhere soon. And the insights from our various guests have been invaluable. Don't forget, mouth-to-mouth kissing improves your relationship. So if you've learned nothing else, Please take that away and we'll see you next time on the OJC, Ontology Journal Club, and link to our longer interviews with all of our guests today, Diana, Derek Ragavan, Mark Lewis, and of course, Vogel, New York. Bye for now. You've been listening to the Oncology Podcast. If you enjoyed today's edition and would like to subscribe, 
head over to our website, oncologynews.com.au and sign up to our newsletter. Thanks for listening.